by now would know where we're going to be going. So turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. A little bit earlier this year, there was a, an artist called Lov. He's a British guy, so Lov. Um, he released a single called Modern Loneliness, and the song seems to highlight the artist's experience of loneliness despite being surrounded by people and social media and all the different connections that we have. And the chorus goes, modern loneliness, we're never alone but always depressed, yeah, love my friends to death but I never call and I never text. You get what you give and you give what you get, so modern loneliness, we love to get high but we don't know how to come down. And if you weren't already depressed, that song ought to do it. <laughs> but the fact is that loneliness is a universal human experience. Uh, to a greater or lesser extent, we've all felt what, it, what that feels like. We've all experienced the need for connection, for belonging, for uh, community. Uh, and yet, although we know we were made for community, we realize that this community can also sometimes be vanity. Even in community, there can be vanity. Some experience this emotion of loneliness to a greater degree than others, but we all know exactly what it means, and we know all too well this familiar feeling of loneliness in ourselves. Now, the last time I preached from this book, I mentioned how Solomon had this idea that wisdom is better than folly, and yet wisdom itself was, fell short of providing lasting meaning. And... He does something very similar tonight. So in chapter 4, we see Solomon giving us, once again, a real paradox. He extols the value of community on the one hand, and yet laments the fact that even in this there is vanity. Community is a good thing, and yet community alone cannot provide the lasting value and joy and meaning that we need. So let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and we'll read the whole chapter. Solomon writes again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, how they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive, but better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after the wind. Again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity in an unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken." Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is a vanity and striving after the wind." Now, there's a common thread, I think, that's running through the book, this, well, this chapter of Ecclesiastes anyway, and that is this idea of the value and meaning of community. And for that reason, I've entitled this sermon, Meaningful Community. Solomon here looks at community from a number of different perspectives. In, in verse 1, you'll notice he looks at the oppressors and the oppressed. In verses 2 and 3, he looks at the living and the dead. In verses 4 to 6, he looks at envy as this driving force behind progress in the world. In verses 7 and 8, he looks at the problem of mortality and the need for an intergenerational community. In verses 9 to 12, he looks at companionship and in verses 13 to 16, he seems to just sum it all up by saying that no matter what your station in life, if you go it alone, 
you are far worse off than if you had done this in, in community with others. So as we begin, let's just lay, lay the foundation by stating the obvious about the creation of community. The obvious statement I'm going to make is that it is not good for man to be alone. In Genesis 2 verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And we know from the rest of the chapter that God made the woman taking the rib out of Adam. And that the problem and the solution came in the context of marriage. But as with much of Genesis, uh, this, this pattern that is presented there, the pattern and the principle must be extrapolated to the rest of life. And that is that man was not made to be alone. Man was made for community. After all, did not God, who exists himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this triune God who is himself called love, did not this awesome God make us in his image? He did. Just as God is a relational being who exists in a sort of perfect community within himself, so man is created for community. Community both with God, our creator, vertically, but then also with one another on a horizontal level. So community is not a crutch. Community is not optional. It's not a compromise. Community is not just for the weak. Community is a blessed reality of life on this earth. But, as with everything else, when we sinned in our father Adam, we brought a curse. We brought a, a break in the relationship with God, a break in our community with God, and by extension, necessarily we brought a break in our relationship with one another. Our experience of relationship and community is not what it was created to be. It has fallen just like everything else. And you can just think back to how that played out in Genesis after the fall. How when God was walking in the garden and found Adam and asked Adam if he had eaten of the tree of, of which he had been told not to eat, Adam didn't give a second thought to throwing Eve right under the bus. The break in the relationship with God had led to a break in this perfect marriage that God had created. How often have you experienced this in your own life, in your own social sphere? You've had some relationship which felt unassailable, and it suddenly just breaks down and leaves you feeling bewildered and hurt. So we not only inherited the sin nature then from Adam, our forefather, but we know from our own experience that we ourselves destroy perfect community on a daily basis. We repeat this pattern of sinning against God and therefore sinning against our fellow man. So we were created for community, but as with everything else, community has been marred by our own sin. And so this sets the stage now for Solomon's treatment of meaningful community in this fourth chap chapter of Ecclesiastes. And he begins with the oppressors and the oppressed. So this pattern of marring community as a result of sin plays out in this fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes in making relationships those which are characterized by the oppressors and the oppressed. Again, if we go back to Genesis and you think about what happened in the garden at the fall, uh, think about how after the fall had happened, Adam was the head of his wife before the fall, which was a good thing, and they, him and his wife functioned in perfect harmony as they carried out the great commission that God had given them. But after the fall, God says that Eve's desire will be for her husband, but that he will rule over her. So no longer would there be this pure and holy um, leadership met with a pure and holy submission. Now there would be a desire to usurp authority from Eve's side and a desire to oppress. A desire to usurp and a desire to oppress. Oppressors and the oppressed. And this theme, I think, is, is something we're all too familiar with in our day and age. This is very prominent. And it seems as if there's many people out there who want to divide the world on this basis. Oppressors and the oppressed. And as a result, of course, everyone wants to be a victim. Uh, you think about the playground stories that must be going on at this stage. And my dad was a victim. My dad's twice as much a victim as your dad. You know, previously, we wanted to be heroic. We wanted to overcome obstacles. But now, it's, it seems as if there's some sort of virtue in victimhood and how oppressed we are. Now the virtue is in giving up, in having as many obstacles against you as you can muster. Of course, no one wants to be the oppressor, so we all need to find ways of being a a greater victim than, than the next person. Uh, 
But I think this is an, an incredibly unhelpful and unbiblical way of viewing the world. This encourages a hatred of those who are better off than you from a financial point of view, and it often imputes motive purely based on someone's life circumstances, often something that they have no control over. It puts the category of oppressor on those whom God has blessed. The Bible calls a hatred of the blessing which God has graciously bestowed on another person envy. And we remember that sermon Ed preached not so long ago on envy. And viewing the world through eyes of envy is evil, and it's a surefire way not only to division, but also to depression. And we see a lot of that around us as well. Now, ironically, people who want to view the world in this way as oppressors and the oppressed, they, they're doing so in part through a sincere desire for community, a sincere desire to belong. We all want to belong to those who are like us. And often we find our identity in the things that, that make us like one another. And the sad irony of the oppressor and oppressed worldview is that it stems from this good desire for community, but in the end it lands up dividing and causing disharmony. But the good news of the gospel is that those who are economically well-off and those who are dirt poor, those who are highly educated and those who have never finished school, those who are executives and those who are the grunts that get the work done, those who have power and those who have no power, these people need not fear and despise one another. Because of the gospel, we, are, we can be brought together in one body as we sit here, where we can share an identity in Christ. Rather than being driven apart by our circumstances, we can experience unity. The book of Acts speaks of the church as having all things in common. Now, this wasn't a sort of like forced communism from the leadership. This was a natural outflow of love that they had for one another. And we have much room to grow as a church, and yet I've personally not only witnessed, but I've been the recipient of this sort of love, this sort of having all things in common um, from people in this body. In Christ, there is, there is neither slave nor free. And this is not to say that all hierarchy disappears or as if uh, societies which are based on hierarchy are somehow anti-Christian, but rather to say that in the church, our love and our affinity and our affection for one another runs a whole lot deeper than social norms. It really ought to if we have the love of Christ among us. We have a sincere fellowship across social and economic strata. In Christ, we realize that none of us really is a victim at all. We've all brought the suffering and pain that we experience to a greater or lesser extent upon ourselves through our sin. None of us is really a victim. We're all high-handed sinners and rebellious against the king. But in Christ, we become gracious recipients of the undeserved kindness of God. And because of this truth, we can then in turn take the mercy and the grace and the love that we have experienced and express that out on our relationships on a horizontal level. We can experience a true love and a true community within the body of Christ here and now, imperfect though it is. Solomon goes even further and he asserts that the only reason that we have progress in the world is because of man's envy. So envy is the driver of progress, according to Solomon. He says, Then I saw, all toil, saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. So each man striving to compete with the guy next door, outdo one another, uh, compete with the Joneses, each man desiring his neighbor's house, his neighbor's wife, ox, donkey, as, as the circumstance may be. Solomon here argues that progress, something which we all think of as a very good thing, progress is driven by evil. It only comes because of man envying his neighbor. And you'll remember last week, Stuart spoke to us about, uh, in chapter 3, verse 16, uh, which says, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And right here in chapter 4, we have an example of that very truth. Even in good progress, good skill and work and hard labor, we have evil, this underlying motive of evil, which is driving this thing that we think of as good. And the reality is this is what sin does to the world. This is how sin affects everything. The, this is the total depravity that Stuart referred to this morning. 
Not that we're all as bad and as evil as we possibly could be, but that evil is touching and tainting everything that we put our hands to. It sullies and corrupts our hearts and therefore our actions and our thoughts and our attitudes. Now Solomon, obviously as we read further, we see clearly he thinks this is lamentable. He calls this a vanity and a striving after the wind. But then in the very next verse, he says that the man who doesn't participate participate in this worldwide envy fest is a fool. The man who folds his hands eats his own flesh. So we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. If we want to progress, we're driven by envy. But if we don't participate in this progress, then we're fools. Can you sense that there's this this despair, this feeling of being trapped in the cycle of envy, this vain cycle of envy. We must compete. We cannot opt out of this competition. We can't stop. We need to strive. We need to improve. We need to innovate. We need to progress. And then we die. How miserable is that existence? In a very real sense, Solomon here is lamenting the inevitability of our depravity. Our depravity means that we land up living out evil Uh, even despite our best intentions, the inescapable evil that comes with being human. I recently, we were away on holiday and I had the opportunity to re-watch that movie called Ants. Uh, And can you believe that was 20 years ago that that was made? The story centers around this worker ant who starts to see the vanity of his life. There's backbreaking work that happens under the ground in the anthill every day. Every ant has its function and its task. They know what they ought to do and they function like clockwork. This ant must work from the moment he is born to the moment he dies. And for what? For what? At the end of the day, some termites come through and they have wars and you know how it goes. Now thankfully, ants in general don't seem to struggle with these existential questions as much as Hollywood would have us believe. But we humans certainly do. We certainly have to work through the reality of vanity. Yet, Most of us land up suppressing these questions. We just drown them out with more work, more effort, more ambition, more pleasure. But Solomon says, better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and striving after the wind. So Solomon acknowledges here that we've been made for community and he realizes that community alone is not enough to bring meaning and joy to our lives. But then he also recognizes that two are better than one. He speaks about the value of family and this need for intergenerational community in verses 7 and 8. He acknowledges that working has some value if you have someone who you can leave the fruits of that labor to. Remember back in chapter 2 how we learned that death is the ultimate vanity. Death is the, the leveler that removes all meaning and joy from human existence as part of the curse. So sin brought death and death brought vanity. We all have this deep desire within us to know that our lives mattered. We want to know that some good will remain after we are gone, after we live, after we die. We want to live on after death. Death is unnatural. And there's something in us which can't bear to think that death is the end. And I think this is a big part of why people get married and have children, in spite of a whole lot of evidence that this is going to make your life very difficult. I think that... We cannot live forever, and so, therefore, the fruit of our vain toil must be left to someone else. And Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But as Christians, I hope that we realize that the inheritance that we leave to our children should be and is far more precious than silver or gold or land or property or reputation. We as believers leave our children and our children's children and our children's grandchildren and their children down to a thousand generations. We can leave them the legacy of a life of faith. We can leave our children a pattern, an example of repentance and of humble submission and obedience to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just at this point ask you, as you, as you hear that and as you think about that, What legacy are you leaving to your children? What will your children remember you for? Why are you toiling and depriving yourself of pleasure? How are you toiling and depriving yourself of pleasure for their internal, eternal inheritance? 
Solomon also speaks of the value of friendship. He says that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. It seems as if he's almost saying that their reward is in the toil which they share, the relationship, the, the community they experience as a result of working together. He says that if one falls, his fellow will lift him up. Now this, I think, applies very much to platonic friendships as well as to marriage and even to the church community, which I'll focus on uh, for our purposes tonight. By God's grace and by his design, we can accomplish more together than we can on our own. We need friends. So again, who are you being a friend to? Who in the church right now, in our family, needs a friend like you? By God's design, the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts uh, because that's how God has created the world to work and the church to work in particular. Solomon spells out, I think, three broad reasons at least for why we need meaningful community. He, he says that we need one another for restoration, for comfort, and for protection. For restoration, for comfort, and for protection. So for restoration... He says that we need one another to help us when we fall. He writes, For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. So when a brother or sister falls into sin, we need others to come alongside him or her and help restore them to health. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And we need to remember, as we approach a brother or sister who has uh, stumbled and fallen, that our goal is restoration. Our goal is never getting them to tick boxes. We don't want to simply go around and hang fruit on a dead tree. What we want to do is sometimes prune a living tree, cutting off the dead wood and the dead leaves and the dead branches in order for that natural fruit to be born. We're not going to them to smack them. We're going to them to encourage restoration. But secondly, comfort. We need one another for comfort. Solomon says, again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? I think we all know what it's like at times to lose perspective. At times to to look at ourselves and see so much of the sin that remains in our hearts and judge ourselves by our failures, feeling like on a day that we've done badly that that God is far from us. We need our brothers and sisters. We need this. This is not a nice to have. We must have our brothers and sisters look into our lives and encourage us in the gospel to point out the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and our progress in sanctification. I think this is a big part of what it means to be a member of a local church. One person can either kid themselves into thinking that they're alive when in fact there's no fruit to that effect, Or a person can be so introspective that they cannot see the leaves and the fruit on their branches. So one of the ways that we can have assurance of salvation, as we'll see through our study in 1 John, is through meaningful church membership, meaningful relationships within the local church. This is why we often bring discipline matters around the communion table. You may have forgotten that, but... um, Prior to COVID and lockdown, when we met for communion more often, you would notice that we often landed up bringing members in and taking members out or informing the congregation of problems around the communion table because we're a family. This regular participation in the one body of Christ is where we can comfort one another that although our sins and failures are evident, we are still together looking to Christ and holding on to his sacrificial death on our behalf. We're still coming boldly to the Father in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when last did you look around and encourage someone about the grace that you've seen in their lives? Paul writes encouraging the believers in Colossae saying, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and because of the love that you have for all the saints. Do you see that? He's encouraging them about specific fruits of the Spirit that he sees in their lives. We need one another for comfort. We need one another to keep warm. But then we also need one another for defense and protection. Solomon says, And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is quickly broken. Do you see how this is defense? There's an attack 
and then there's defense. We need to be thinking the best of one another in order to defend one another. We need to have one another's backs. We need to know that we've got one another's backs. We need to defend one another against slander and against gossip. We need to be encouraging restoration rather than division. Galatians 5 verse 15 says, But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Just as a fool eats his own flesh, I think the fool will also eat one another's flesh. We need to be looking out for the sin taking a foothold in the lives of our brothers and sisters. We need to point it out and we need to be warning our brothers and sisters against it. Again, for the point of of restoration ultimately, but even before it gets to that stage, uh, as you see someone engaging in entertainment habits which are going to lead to sin, let's defend one another by pointing these things out. We need to be sharing the gospel with one another and helping each other to put on the whole armor of God. We need to come alongside one another, practically holding each other accountable, knowing each other's weaknesses and praying earnestly for people in the weaknesses that they've shared for their besetting sins. Christ does promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And it's a wonderful promise. We know we will, one day the church will be successful. We'll see Christ will be vindicated. But the gates of hell can prevail very much against one who stands alone. We see this in those who do not persevere to the end. We have the promises of Christ's help as we take hold of the means of grace that he has provided. And one of those means of grace is very much relationships, godly families, godly friendships, godly church families. So do not neglect these things. Don't be so quick to write a person off or a community off because they're not perfect. We remember we're a work in progress and yet we need one another for our defense and protection. So finally in this chapter we see the preacher again extolling the value of community by contrasting this poor but wise youth with an old and foolish king. Now, you might be wondering, what made the difference? Is it their ages, perhaps? The fact that the youth was wise, that's what many would have us believe today, that the youth know what's going on. But I don't think so, because Proverbs is very clear about the fact that wisdom naturally comes with age, with experience comes wisdom. So the normal progress of things would be that the older man would be wise and the young man would be foolish, and yet that isn't the case here. This is the opposite of the norm. The thing which made the youth wise, I think, and the old king foolish, was precisely their approach to community. Their attitude to going it alone. The youth was wise because he knew how to rely on his brothers, whereas this old and foolish king no longer knew how to take advice. Probably because he had become proud and self-reliant and dependent on his own resources. He would also, unfortunately though, we see the vanity in all this that this youth who becomes the king will ultimately grow self-reliant and self-sufficient and will become a fool because that's what sin does. Sin corrupts even something which is good. Sin makes us think that we can be God. Sin makes us think that we are, are much better than we really are. Sin, helps us see, sin seeks to use others to get us to the point where we think we need to be, somehow using others as stepping stones rather than um, uh, as as beloved brothers and sisters helping one another on our quest to Christ-likeness. Solomon says, And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive, but better than both is he who has not yet been born. This is, I think, typical, almost suicidal thinking of despairing believers. And yet... These things are not our choices to make. We don't choose when we are born and we don't choose when we die. And if we die without Christ, this vain life will be the most meaning and joy that we'll ever experience. In hell, there is no meaningful community. There's no companionship. There's no... Even here on earth, we experience the vestiges of community and companionship and the joy of, of good, godly relationships. But in hell, there's none of that. That's all removed. All the vestiges of goodness and synergy are removed and there will only be unending vanity. But it doesn't have to be like that. So man is made for community by God's good and perfect design. But because of sin and the curse, we've marred this community um, 
and we no longer live in perfect fellowship with one another and with God. Our break in our relationship with God has brought this break in our relationship on a horizontal level. Like wisdom, folly, pleasure, work, leisure, self-indulgence, food, sex, and great learning, community under the sun cannot provide lasting meaning and joy on its own. But again, just like wisdom, community and relationship still bears like the glowing coals of the remnants of the pure fires of joy and meaning with which they were created. Our hearts resonate as we experience the blessing of godly friendships, godly marriages, and godly church family. God is love, and He, through the life and death of Christ on behalf of sinners, has opened the way for us, fallen though we are, to be restored, to be made part of His love, to share in His perfect fellowship, both with Himself and with one another. So, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and experience meaningful community here and now, which we know and have hope will only grow and flourish into perfection throughout all eternity. Let's pray. Our Father, we are reminded, as we have been so many times in this book of Ecclesiastes, just at, at what a mess we've made at what great evil we have wrought into this world through our own sin and depravity and our rebellion against you. And Lord, we don't want to take this lightly. We don't want to forget what a serious thing this was. And yet, Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that you, you are love. You experience perfect community. You do not need anyone outside of yourself. And yet, you were willing to send your only son to die on our behalf. You are willing to send your only son to bear the curse that we deserve so that we can be brought into this perfect fellowship with you. Lord, we pray that you would please help us, having been saved, having been brought into this fellowship with you, having experienced mercy and grace. We pray that you would help us not to throw this away. Help us, Lord, not to limp along. Help us, Lord, not to be self-sufficient. We pray that we would lean on one another, that we would defend one another, that we would restore one another and protect one another, that we would comfort one another. We pray, O oh God, that you would please make this church and our families and our marriages and our friendships into meaningful relationships that would grow and flourish throughout all eternity. And we pray most of all that you would please help us to grow in our knowledge and love of yourself and help one another as we do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.